Greetings um, on behalf of Bhavan's SPJMR. Uh, welcome to another webinar from the Center for Financial Studies. Uh, the intent of these webinars is to hear and learn from leading experts as we continue on uh, SPJMR's journey to create knowledge and influence practice. The topic of today's webinar is revival of India's economy. And I have the pleasure of formally introducing my very well-known distinguished fellow panelists and our equally well-known moderator. I'm going to do them a grave injustice, keeping this intro really brief so that we can dive into the panel discussion right away. Dr. Pran Pranab Sen is currently the director of the IGC India program. He was formerly the, the chief statistician of India, the first chief statistician of India. He is um, one of India's leading macroeconomists and uh, statisticians, and his name is associated with many, many committees and commissions. Uh, I'm not going to list them out. Uh, he's also a fantastic teacher, and uh, many of us consider ourselves to be his ekalavyas. Um, Dr. Ratin Roy is uh, currently director and CEO of uh, the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, NIPFP. Like Dr. Sen, his name is associated with many committees and, and commissions, too numerous to list out. And uh, till recently, he was, uh, till some time back, he was a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council as well. He's a leading voice on applied macroeconomics and fiscal policy. And when he talks, we all listen. Dr. Anant Nageshwar, Ananta Nageshwaran, is an accomplished practitioner. He's worked in UBS and Credit Suisse and, and Julius Baird. Uh, and he's also a fantastic teacher. He's uh, currently a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory uh, Council. So if you have any suggestions, you know whom to apply them to. Uh, he's again been part of many boards and committees. Uh, he's an incredible reader and a storehouse of knowledge. His blog, the, the Gold Standard site, uh, it features as one of the best economic uh, blogs worldwide. Uh, we also have Ida Dutal. She's the editor and arguably the, the best known face in this lot. Uh, she's the editor, Banking, Finance and Economy at uh, Bloomberg Quint. Uh, she recently celebrated 20 years in journalism. Um, many rate her as the best anchor, commentator and thought leader in her field today. Um, Ira, thanks a lot for being here. Um, we couldn't have asked for a better moderator for this uh, for this excellent panel. Uh, last but not the, uh, last, uh, this my name is Anant Narayan, and I'm associate professor at SPJMR. I have the fantastic privilege today of joining this very very eminent um, uh, panel for for what will hopefully be a, a great set of discussions. Ira, all over to you. The, the baton is yours now. Right. Uh, thanks so much, Anant, and uh, you know, thanks to the wonderful panel uh, for being here. Uh, now, uh, you know, a panel like this, uh, typically, I wouldn't waste their time asking them about the here and now. Uh, the idea would be to get deeper thoughts into uh, what the Indian economy uh, needs to do to try and move ahead from a pre-COVID slowdown worsened by sharp contraction in the COVID period. But uh, unfortunately, we are in a situation where uh, the damage remains work in progress. The government's response remains work in progress. So I am going to start by uh, bringing focus to the here and now immediately for, uh, for a little bit of this conversation. And I'll start with Dr. Sen, uh, because he's done an extensive five-part series on Ideas for India, uh, where he has given out his framework of assessing the damage. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, you know, some of us are uh, tracking the concurrent indicators, which showed a pick up to about, say, 70-75% of activity levels, and then has shown a predictable flattening out and a little bit of a decline as well in recent weeks. Uh, does your analytical framework continue to suggest a very deep contraction in the real GDP numbers uh, for India? And as an afterthought of that, uh, is it uh, absolutely uh, sort of you know obvious that the government's uh, response remains inadequate? Well, let me begin by saying that uh, what you should expect to observe is that if you go by growth rates, you should expect growth rates to climb secularly over the next three to four quarters. And that would be extremely misleading. I mean, if you think that that is then the precursor of a complete revival, you would be wrong. Because what you really need to track are the absolute values. So what you're going to get is the first quarter of the year, which will be terrible, depending on who you believe in. My estimate is about minus 25%. It'll improve to about minus 5%. It'll go into positive territory next uh, calendar year, right? Now that doesn't mean we are out of the woods because what will happen and what would have been happening all the time 
that the level of GDP would still be significantly below the levels we had attained in 2019-20. So my first advice is please track the absolute numbers. Do not, for God's sake, get excessively focused on growth rates because that's going to be very misleading. Now, as far as the government's response is concerned, I think the government has been extremely uh, proactive. It's been very, very quick in responding to the immediate challenge. And the immediate challenge was that because of the lockdown, you had a situation where companies were in a, not just companies, I mean, this is all production enterprises who were in the non-essential sector were in a situation where they couldn't produce and therefore couldn't generate any income whatsoever. Now, if that is the case, you have a situation that if they have to continue to service their debts, they would have would become NPAs within the, the lockdown period. Now, the government, the RBI in particular, RBI acted very quickly and then the government backstopped them with guarantees acted very quickly on this, and I think it saved a lot of companies up to this point. The second step is that once the lockdown is lifted, you need to be able to provide these companies with sufficient liquidity so that they're able to resume production because they will have to have a lot of startup costs that will have to be borne, and they simply will not have the funds for it. Now, some of that has already been provided in these 20 lakh crore uh, announcement, the Atmanirbha Bharat uh, package, uh, particularly the uh, 3 lakh crore provision for MSMEs, which is 100% guaranteed by the government. The problem, of course, in that is the discretion is left to banks. Now, the banking sector has been risk averse well before COVID even began, was, was even thought of. And COVID has created a degree of uncertainty where everybody in the economy has very high levels of uncertainty. And in the case of the banking sector, it is uncertainty loaded onto already existing uncertainty. So their willingness to lend to anybody except their very, very best clients is going to be low. Yes. The million dollar question, of course, is that what proportion of the economy do their very, very best clients account for? And I suspect it could be pretty small. Uh, Dr. Sanvi, uh, uh, we will you know, sort of discuss some of these aspects in greater detail. If I can just uh, widen out the conversation and then come to them step by step. Uh, Dr. Roy, you had taken uh, undertaken an analytical exercise as well, uh, an article that you published. You looked at it from the perspective of nominal GDP. Uh, but were your broad findings similar to what Dr. Sen is saying, that uh, if you look at levels, it is going to take a while for us to even get back to 2019, 20 levels. Uh, and we will continue to see deep contraction at least the first two quarters, uh, nominal terms and real terms this year. You're in mute, uh, Dr. Roy. Sorry about that. So let me for thanks. So let me forget that yes, of course, I I my exercise is in concordance with what Pranab did. There's a second version coming out, which is a little more optimistic day after tomorrow. But nevertheless, we are looking at double-digit declines in nominal growth rates this year. It's a worst case scenario. So what I did was I looked at um, the extent to which on the demand side. Uh, loss of income led to a reduction in demand. And looking across the three sort of macro sectors and uh, foreign trade activity. So while the current account deficit is positive, the fact that your trading activity is smaller, next by the same, means less demand from that source. And the government uh, uh, on track record was not going to be boosting demand simply because uh, much of its uh, fiscal deficit action so far, would basically make up for the shortfall in tax revenues, which is also a consequence of falling incomes and consumption. So if you look at it that way, then I was getting a fairly large, around 15, 14% fall in the nominal growth rate. On the supply side, 
uh, I calculated what I call restoration ratios. So on current information available inductively, what proportion of agricultural output, primary sector output, organized manufacturing output, unorganized manufacturing output, and informal services and formal services would be restored and by way. So you get different timelines for each of these, but broadly speaking, that said that uh, you know it would be about 2%, the, the nominal fall then if there'd been no demand shock would have been about 2% less than the demand side. So if you look at those two, then basically you would assume that supply would adjust to demand. Uh, and that's a positive on this, but even if you add that positive on, my worst case scenario would be a double digit fall of between 12 and 14%, depending on what happens to inflation. Now today's inflation numbers are encouraging. If those hold for the year, then the fall would be in single digits. Obviously it's nominal, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm in broad concordance with him, and uh, I'd like to emphasize that we are facing a very odd shock here. The shock has happened in the supply side because people have been unable to produce, and similarly, there's a shock on the demand side because people are able to earn incomes, especially in the informal sector. That restoration in the supply side will not bring about a paripasu restoration of incomes and consumption unless something happens going forward, and therefore we are going to look at a negative shock this year. And if you write that in a multi-period. Then if you have a negative shock this year, for that negative shock to restore 1920 levels of supply and demand next year is highly unlikely, again, unless something happens in terms of policy interventions. So I'm looking at negative growth this year and mildly negative growth next year unless inflation blesses us. But that carries its own set of problems. We can take that up later. Uh, and sort of recovery uh, in 21-22 also will depend for me finally on a very key question, to what extent does the output composition of demand and supply change in response to the crisis? Simple example, if the uh, total contribution of healthcare in 21 22 is much greater than it was in 1920, we will have a better recovery than if it remained the same. Thanks. Fair enough. Uh, uh, Dr. Nageshwan, I'll, I'll put the same question to you, although I do want to encourage the panelists to jump in as they feel necessary. Let's. Uh, uh, you know, we are definitely have their debate. say first. Then we will yes. tear each other up. All right. Dr. Nageshwan, do you have a, a slightly more optimistic view of the world or view of India? No, I think it will be difficult for me to uh, contradict uh, both my panelists who went before me. Anta, I, have, I can't hear you properly. Can you come closer to the mic, please? Sure. No, I was just saying that. Are you able to hear me better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I was just saying that uh, it will be difficult for me to contradict both the panelists who went before me for the simple reason that I don't have a model of my own to be able to uh, say that I have an alternative estimate. And I, just as you did, I, Ira, I had also finished reading Dr. Dr. Sen's five-part uh, uh, article, which was also a great paper. Uh, uh, giving us a good context into the post-2008 and post-2016 demonetization, growth outcomes, etc. So I think, um, you know, so, so the optimistic scenario would be what the consensus is saying, which is that a real GDP contraction of minus 5 to minus 6%. So, uh, of course, I, I saw the NCAER estimate, um, which is uh, plus 1.3%, and I'm still sort of trying to grapple with the numbers to be able to see where they get it. But I think Dr. Sen's point is very well taken because we know that if you have a 40% drop from a baseline number and then you even go grow by 30% afterwards, you are still going to be down by 22% from the original uh, situation that you were in. So I think uh, the question is therefore focusing on how soon or how sustainably you can return to the 2020 number. So I would go with the... Uh, the, the numbers are already out there and I don't have an alternative optimistic or pessimistic number to offer you as a counterpoint here at this stage. All right, uh, Professor Narayan, uh, slightly, uh, you know, a question with a twist to you uh, because, uh, you know, you keep us all honest. Now, you know, what we're hearing from Dr. Sen, Dr. Roy, Professor, uh, Dr. Nageshwan, uh, is something that we have now been discussing uh, for, well, a good two months, right? I mean, from minus five to minus six to minus 10, the numbers have been, uh, you know, going up and down. Have we seen a commensurate sort of acceptance of this reality within government, within policymakers, which then spurs a set of actions? Great question, Neera. So uh, let me just add to what the uh, distinguished voices said before me. Um, I use my crazy little Excel spreadsheet as well. It is no way as intricate as the exercise that Dr. Sen or Dr. Roy did. 
um, I used a simple input output table and used some a bit of pull out of thin air numbers as well. Uh, but very straightforward, given the level of uh, lockdown and the fact that big parts of the economy were visibly closed between March 25th. Of course, they progressively opened up in stages, you know, April 20th, May 3rd, uh, June 3rd, and so on and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, vast parts of the economy were still closed. Uh, even now, we've not come back anywhere close to full 100% GDP. Given all of that, mathematically, uh, I tend to agree with the numbers given by Dr. Sen and Dr. Roy. I think we see a double-digit contraction for FI21. It will take a lot of inputs in terms of policy and, and actual money being spent to repair that and to change that. So we are looking at a double-digit contraction, I think. Uh, the consequences of that, I think, are also important. Um, of course, there's an impact on employment. But as Dr. Sen was saying, because of uh, some timely government intervention, particularly ramping up uh, Mahatma Gandhi Narega, uh, as well as the fact that you know Food Corporation of India is now sitting on record stocks, a lot of procurement has happened, and monsoons seem to be doing us a good turn. All of that, I think, as the CMI reports also indicate, is giving some relief on the employment front. But it's not restored employment. It is make makeshift employment in lieu of what's been lost. Right? For businesses, there's been a lot of losses. I mean, if you have a double digit contraction, that's a body blow to an already weak economy at multiple fronts. So, you know, we talk about 63 million uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. At least anecdotal evidence suggests that a big chunk of them, maybe even 20% of them, could be facing a existential crisis in some form or shape. And I, I, I don't think, frankly, that's getting resolved just by a provision of liquidity. And what does that mean for the banking sector? Banking sector and the financial services ecosystem, anyway, was sitting on large non-performing assets. That number could go up to anything close to 18 to 20% of advances if this thing pans out the way it's panning out. What does it mean for fiscal deficit? Uh, we could be looking at a center plus state fiscal deficit of upwards of, I think, 14% of GDP. I think more packages will come through. And the fact is our tax collections are, are collapsing given there's no economic activity. Plus, of course, the denominator itself in terms of GDP is coming down. So all of this is kind of going against us. Uh, there will be monetization. RBI is monetizing. It will continue to monetize. So that's the broad picture I get. Now, in terms of what is there an acknowledgement of that? I think there is. Uh, while you know people might not be as blunt with the numbers as, as we're all being here, uh, I think there's a broad acknowledgement that this is possibly the biggest economic crisis that we've seen in our lifetime, certainly I've seen in my lifetime. Now, um, is the response commensurate to that? Look, uh, I put it into two levels. As Dr. Sen said, I think the, the after a probably a slow start, the response we've seen in terms of Narega picking up, you know, numbers from the Narega website show 37 lakh, uh, 37,000 crores have been spent. That's 37% of the full year budget until the June quarter itself. And looks like even July is continuing in the same vein. Uh, plus, Food Corporation of India, as I said, is sitting on 97 million tons of, of stock now. They've procured a lot of food grains despite COVID-19. So all of that is clearly helping at an area which is good. You know, rural economy, and a lot of questions come up as to why are we giving largest to rural economy. I think that's the only sector which is not impacted by COVID-19. So if you have any hope of spending coming through, it's a rural economy. So that's good. Where I think we've not smelt the coffee as yet, the pain that businesses are going through you know, giving them liquidity by way of three lakh crores, et cetera, is not enough. Their bottom lines are hurting. They're having an existential crisis. There, I think the relief is inadequate. And hopefully the next round of relief measures will be concentrating on them. Besides, of course, whoever is, you know, having a humanitarian or, a, or, a, or an economic distress in terms of livelihoods. Uh, Dr. Roy, uh, you know, so Dr. Sen was talking about the immediate response, but let me ask you, uh, the immediate response had some cash transfers, had food transfers, had an, uh, you know, sort of up uh, up budget on the Narega side. Uh, the food transfers have been, have been extended. That was sort of a no-brainer given the stocks we had. The cash transfers have not. Uh, and Manrega, uh, the demand is already well, uh, running well ahead of the supply. So even in terms of putting a floor on the damage, do we need a second round before we start talking about repairing the damage? I don't know, but you're right when you say damage, because let us be clear that the measures that you mentioned were not measures to stimulate demand. They were relief measures, just like you have in a flood or something. And I don't know what the disaster management situation is at risk, and that those relief measures need to be continued or not. Dr. Sen, uh, would you have liked to see at least the cash transfers continue? Uh, although I know that that would have meant an immediate sort of you know, acceptance of 
geographical uh, expansion. You're on mute, sir. You're on mute, sir. On mute. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be very clear. First of all, <clears throat> the cash transfers were a good idea, but the amounts were a joke. 500,000 rupees for a person who has lost his job doesn't even cover three days. So what does it do for the remaining 27? It should have been at least 3,000 to 4,000 for it to have made sense, both in terms of what Rothin said, which is as a relief measure. And you would need to go above that if you wanted it as a demand stimulus measure. Okay, you are well below that. So let's not even talk about it as a, as a stimulus of any variety. The question is, do we need a stimulus? And the answer is, is yes. You know, this is what Anand was talking about. <clears throat> the basic problem now is what is going to happen to businesses. We are now in a situation where lockdown is lifted, but demand doesn't exist. And if this demand constraint binds for an extended period of time, what you're going to see is a bloodbath among the MSMEs. And this is the point that Ranit was making, I think. Now, if you do see that, then you're faced looking at a situation where towards the end of this calendar year, maybe very early next calendar year, we'll be back to a supply constraint, not because there's a lockdown, but because capacities have simply closed. And then demand can increase however much you like. And all that will happen is that either you'll get imports or you'll get inflation. So the real message that one would like to convey is perhaps you're doing a leap of faith. I'm talking to the government now. But please, if you have to do any demand stimulus, do it now. Don't do it three months later because you may have well missed the bus. Dr. Nageshwaran, uh, already running late, not even on, uh, the reason I was focusing on the cash transfers is because my point is that you haven't even completed the repair part of this exercise, leave alone the stimulus part. Uh, but it seems like, uh, you know, it's getting later and later in the year and it's becoming more and more immediate to come out with that package, which may have a repair component and a stimulus component. Well, I, I, I heard Dr. Sen uh, quite clearly. So yeah, sometimes uh, uh, you have to have a leap of faith and take an action and i think this is a kind of action that you can roll back in case it turns out to have been unnecessary so from that point of view so the, i mean i'm just trying to sort of do some uh, why is the government hesitating uh, or, or is the government being somewhat cautious in in, in providing demand stimulus so uh, clearly the the, the the events at the in the border with china uh, showed us that the government was probably right in preserving some firepower because of the additional defense spending now that will be required. So, to, so to that extent, you know, their caution was vindicated. Uh, but, you know, you look at the GST collection in June, which looked like uh, just about 10 to 20 percent short of the normal month. But then you also had the market IHS business outlook survey, which was the worst in 11 years. So you have to balance the two. And as Anand has very eloquently put it, uh, support given to the businesses right from the beginning has been somewhat uh, you know, uh, on the parsimonious side. So, and I think I would go with the risk management approach and it, that would favor what Dr. Sen said. You can err on the side of being somewhat uh, liberal because I think you can always uh, roll it back. Uh, so in that sense, if you, if you think in a risk management framework, then the answer becomes obvious. Uh, Dr. Roy? No, I actually want to come in and make a point for your audience, which may not be apparent. While I would have preferred a very different approach to this problem right from the beginning, as I've written about, massive income support and massive support to prevent asset destruction, there is a logic in this approach. And the key to that logic is in understanding why is the RBI, the, to quote Sherlock Holmes, the only dog, or misquote Sherlock Holmes, that is barking so hard in the night time. That's not typical. Typically, finance ministries bark and central banks follow. All the barking is being done by the central bank. Then you ask, if the market is done by the central bank and the uh, sort of Mahabharata, uh, mini Mahabharata five day, uh, how do I put it, uh, <laughs> elocution that we have to go through from the finance minister, 
focus mainly on credit policy and monetary, monetary policy measures, other than honey and beekeeping, then I have to ask myself what is the logic, and I'll tell you what I think it is. If this were the UK 1985, and if by some miracle the Prime Minister, I know it's not Anand, had an advisor in his PMEAC who was an unreconstructed Thatcherite, then this is exactly what he would do. Because you would say very clearly that the state has no business interfering in business. Business must stand on its own feet, become what? Akkal Ibhar. And to do that, if the state has to suspend some rules like collateral, provide credit and ample measure, increase liquidity, we will do down that for you. But the business of dealing with demand and supply and keeping your business going, you have to do. And if you can't do it and burn, tough. Others will come in through creative destruction and the economy will rejuvenate. Government's job is to provide the ability for businesses to deal with situations. And then if you add to the fact that somewhat puzzlingly to many, but now I think this must be the only logical explanation, like Sherlock Holmes. Why would a government that was not, you know, influenced by the media and Narsema Rao and all that, you know, start announcing long-term reform measures in that five-day elocution? It didn't make any sense right then, but there is a logic to it. Because what the government is also signaling to you is, we are going, to, we are signaling to you our intention of significantly withdrawing from the business of productive asset management. That is the public sector. We are going to be privatizing. We are going to be making it very easy for you to buy these things. We are going to be delisting FDs from the stock exchange. So they're going to give you a rules network and an asset space to grow. But what we have to do to grow, don't look at the taxpayer for support. If that is the government's, I'm, I'm inferring the government's intention, the government has not said so, they have just come and given me a five-day elocution and then radio silence. If that is indeed the government's, you know, approach, strategic approach to this, then it would follow that to do massive income support now on top would be a great mistake. Once you have chosen your path, you must walk it. And if this is the path the government has chosen, then we all have to walk it. And we have to endure the process of creative destruction going forward. What we have to look to government to do is to speedily implement these regulatory reform measures, announce its privatization program without worrying about what people will say about underselling or underbuying of assets, ignore the Swadeshi Jagran Munch, and proceed along the path that this mythical Chachanite sage seems to have laid out for them. Thank you. Dr. Lageshwaran, uh, uh, yeah, I just, uh, your recent blog was titled, uh, Do States, Markets, Institutions, and Literacy Matter as Much as We Think or Does Stuff Happen? Uh, was the subtext in that blog somewhere in keeping with uh, what Dr. Roy said? I read that. <laughs> So, I mean, I think that was more of a, uh, it, it does have some uh, resonance to the current situation, but yeah, uh, but it's more of a blue sky uh, uh, thinking. So his his point is that, is that was the government uh, in effect say, of course, as, as he put it correctly, the government didn't come out and articulate to the extent that he articulated, that is that, you know, we are going to sort of make it easy for you to uh, take over the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, and we're going to get out of the way, uh, and therefore you manage both the upside and the downside yourself. And we will just do some minor facilitation through the credit and the liquidity. And so, if it was articulated that way, then obviously uh, I think the business also would be aware of what to expect and what not to expect. Uh, of course, uh, I will even add to his point. In September, well before the COVID happened, the government announced the tax cuts, the corporate tax cuts, uh, extending it to all businesses, which is also a supply side uh, 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 measure. Uh, but I think whether, whether the government has an attitude that Dr. Roy so eloquently elaborated or not is something that I think it needs to be made explicit so that businesses know what to expect and what not to expect. But right now, the feeling is that uh, they, they, they are in a bit of a limbo. And also, I would say philosophies are all right because the conservative government of 2020 is doing something very different from what the conservative government of 18, 1985 would have never contemplated doing. So uh, every ideology has its context. And I think that's exactly what the blog post was trying to uh, convey because I don't think these things are really cost in store or should be cost in store. I think that the context will determine what is the right approach to follow. So from that perspective, I would even argue this being an extraordinary situation, I would say 
supply side measures uh, privatization etc all very welcome very preferable from the long term point of view but in the short term there is room for support but with quid pro quo in the sense of performance obligation similar to what east asia did back in the 60s and 70s and 80s you give support but you demand productivity and export growth etc or governance whatever it is so i think there is a room for some sort of a via media between active demand management and a hands off attitude just just clearing the ground for them to grow because right now that probably isn't going to happen so i'll just leave it there professor narayan you want to pick up from there i heard i saw you shaking your head so i assume you agree at least with the part that there is some intervention still to come and necessary oh absolutely you know so look uh, i'll try and break this up into two or three parts on do we need more relief going through uh, look initially i think the government started off on a very weak note there was simply not enough relief going through particularly with the migrant workers going through the the, the chaos that they did i think it was a, it was a terrible time subsequently though if i look at simply the unemployment numbers coming out from cmie uh, combination of narega combination of a, a, a good uh, harvesting season or a, or a good sowing season going through seems to be playing out the other big thing which i think uh, is is doing a lot in terms of relief that you alluded to ira is the fact that we now have food security now we can argue about how how efficient is it is everybody that deserves it getting it etc uh, by and large in the rural areas at least it seems to be working at least that's what the research indicates so you know uh, it might not be 800 million people but whatever number of people are getting food security 5 kgs of grains till november i think that's a great relief as well right where i think relief is still required is probably for the urban unemployed um and and ways in which you get back unemployed or, or, or people to move back into the urban areas for 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 employment eventually i think that's the area where questions remain on businesses to the point that dr roy made and the point that uh, uh, professor van made um look um let, let's think about what the concerns could be about giving relief to bottom lines of businesses again this is relief this is not about demand stimulus one is of course um, how do you give it in a in a country like india sure we're becoming more formalized there is more database available but how do you dole out money to who everybody is clamoring for relief you know real estate sector auto sector export sector everybody is clamoring for relief how do you dole this out right second thing is you don't want to be called a suit boot ki sarkar which means you give out relief to somebody it's a big man and and then everybody answers on you saying you know you're doing the wrong things so one way to probably address this is look at what everybody is looking at which is the msme sector and for the en mass the entire msme sector try and see if you can give some relief and one quest one area which i think even people like dr rakesh mohan have talked about is giving interest subvention right you essentially if you have 20 lakh crores of outstanding msme loans 3 months 6 months say you know what entire interest i'll take on the burden it's not a big deal it's it's you know uh, if if it's 20 lakh crores for for 6 months let's say 10% interest rate you're looking at 1 lakh crores that's you know that's nothing it's it's something we can easily live with so maybe that kind of stuff would be probably be doable now that's for the relief part on demand and stimulus look a it's a medical question we have to first come to a situation where we are in a position to consume which means money coming into our hands all of us on this chat should be in a position to go out and consume right uh, that's a medical question unfortunately out of syllabus out of our hands uh, as and when we hopefully come to the stage where spending is coming back into normal i would strongly argue that any fiscal stimulus for demand has to be accompanied by what anant was mentioning which is you have to have output going up as well we can't have a countenance a situation where what we've been doing for the last 10 15 years continues which is you put money in the hands of people fine but most of the consumption is being met by imports your consumption as a percentage of of gdp of uh, uh, you know the, the, the imports net trade deficit as a, con- a percentage of gdp keeps going up it's now you know between 7 to 8% which is a very very high number it used to be 1 or 2% uh, till uh, 20 years ago um you can't have a situation where we are simply not producing enough for ourselves if you don't if you give money in the hands of people where we are not con- con- you know creating proper jobs and proper output you will lead to all the financial stability issues that dr sen and dr roy mentioned which is inflation currency weaknesses and all of that we need both to go together you have to have a demand stimulus along with taking steps to ensure that output can follow and i will submit at this at this juncture there are serious structural impediments which come in the way of creation of sustainable jobs and output there's a long long way to go it's not just about the fisc it's about those real economy reforms to ensure jobs and output can follow 
Okay, and I think I <clears throat> there's one minor fiscal point I'd like to very quickly add, if I may. Uh, see, I think by now, seven years into government, I think the prime minister and his political colleagues have a fairly good idea about the quality and capability of the central government civil service in delivering things. They can order people about, they can issue notifications, they don't regulate very well. But when it comes to income transfer, other than this Jandan business, which is actually the crudest form of income transfer, find a bank, put money, find a bank, put money, anything slightly more sophisticated, either requires you to, you know, basically finance the states and, and non-central government machineries to do it. Or you're going to get very ineffective implementation. If you look at all centrally sponsored schemes and the quality of implementation, it's ineffective. So then taking a precious fiscal rupee, giving it to an ineffective bureaucracy to roll out with 30-40% leakages could be terribly counterproductive. Now you can't say that in your five, you know, part peroration, but I would say that that's in the backdrop. They've quietly taken a call that this public service delivery system is simply not capable of doing anything at the kind of levels of ambition that a support package would require on the demand side, and so let's not do it. Possible. I'm just again, it's, a, it's an inference, but I think it's a reasonable inference. Okay, uh, Dr. Sen, uh, you know, uh, just coming back to the SME point, actually links it to what Dr. Uh, Roy is also saying that if you're designing relief measures via the banking system, perhaps you think that that's the best way to do it. Although, given the state of our banking system, uh, you know, I think Anand uh, would certainly disagree. I would disagree as an outsider, but. Uh, I have the, the, you wrote in your article that let's double the working capital limit. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan said, let's provide uh, subsidy to uh, these uh, MSMEs. Uh, the government has backstopped guarantee, fairly large amount, 3 lakh crore. But my point is that the SMEs will be reluctant to take on debt if they are uncertain about their business. Is debt the solution in a, in a situation like this? No, that, that is precisely the point I think we've been trying to make, which is that the liquidity support that is being given is just to keep the businesses alive until they are ready to start. The question that you ask me is the really the legitimate question, which is when will they be ready to start? When will they think that, okay, I think we can now begin production because we'll be able to sell the stuff that we make. Now, that's, that really is the critical issue. And that's where the whole demand part of the problem crops up. Um, now, the question as to how to do it, you know, Rosin has already talked about the, uh, the politics of uh, fiscal stimulus. And I think he has a point there. Because fiscal stimulus can be of various kinds. The main one, as Rosin said, is that the delivery system in government is predominantly in the hands of the state. But the states don't have the money to do a fiscal stimulus. The money has to come from the center. The problem that Rokin is trying to point out, and he's done it very delicately, I'll be more blunt, is who gets the political benefit? Is it the state government or is it the center? Now, if you actually route it through the states, then the center runs the risk of having footed the bill and got no credit for it. And if the center tries to do it on its own, then as Rokin quite rightly said, and I've been in the central government for many, many years, they'd make a complete hash of it. But the one thing that the central government can do, and they can do it directly, is what Anand talked about, which is essentially support the enterprises themselves, which is why their focus and their hope is we will support the enterprises and then hope like hell that the demand will emerge somehow. There'll be some kind of a trickle down effect playing out. Uh, unfortunately, that is not something that is likely to happen. Interestingly, I'm just sort of glancing at the comments. So a couple of them, we'll address them uh, perhaps in the course of them. One of them is, you know, uh, trickle down economics. Uh, let's give up on that. And let's perhaps, you know, as a, a corollary, have more uh, directed uh, relief uh, stimulus to sectors. And the other one is that should we move more towards the states to provide relief? Uh, do they have better uh, machinery? Uh, Dr. Nageshwan, do you want to uh, pick up on 
both this absolutely large problem of how do you design relief for private enterprises who may need very different things sector to sector company to company uh, and uh, you know and if that's not an option then do you just do a large government public works program either to the central government or a combination of central and state no, I think uh, again, uh, Dr. Roy made a very important observation. Again, inferring from the government's uh, reluctance to spend money through the bureaucracy, and I find that inference a lot more plausible uh, than the first one, which he mentioned about the philosophical reason being somewhat reluctant to provide support. Why don't we try to find some strategic? Rashtar for what is got absolutely. I mean, so we're all uh, uh, absolutely. So no, no. I think that is par for the course, and that's what this this discussion is all about. So, if that is the case, then we should still stick to the liquidity support framework, low interest rate or interest rate subvention. And I go back to the three lakh crores uh, support. Now, you you take a look at the document that Crystal produced way back in end of April. They looked at forty thousand companies. And the total uh, uh, to, uh, employee cost of them was close to about uh, the total total. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, revenues were about 11 lakh crores. Eight percent of that constituted basically their uh, uh, the top. Uh, the first 70 percent of those companies were below 100 crores, and they only had 88 thousand crores of annual employee cost. So. A three lakh crore uh, government guaranteed credit facility more than provides for companies with 100 crore turnover to pay for one year of employee cost. You could have extended, one could extend that uh, credit facility all the way up to companies with 500 crores or 1000 crores and you, the three lakh crores would still be adequate. Then the question is whether the 9% interest rate that is being charged on this is the right interest rate or should it be even lower at 7? Therefore, my point is, I, I don't think the government, given the budget situation that it faces, is in a position to give outright grants and therefore uh, you know, incur on budget uh, fiscal deficit because forget about the credit rating agencies. If the bond market continued to react as the, the way it did in the month of March for developing economies, we are all now speaking with the benefit of hindsight that the bond market uh, yield is 5.8% for the 10-year treasury. Suppose uh, the reaction was very different, regardless of what the credit rating agencies did, then we could say that government would be undoing its work uh, if the uh, sovereign borrowing costs went up. Uh, and then uh, it would spill over into private sector borrowing costs as well. So I think uh, the liquidity route is a compromise. The question is, could it have been extended to more enterprises given the size of the amount in place? So I would argue, therefore, for continuing with the approach but making the, making the beneficiaries net much wider. Uh, Professor Narayan, you want to come in? And do call me Anantya. I, I, I don't know who Professor Narayan is, to be honest. Uh, but um, um, so here is a quick uh, rejoinder. Um, look, if I was my old bank, wearing my old banker hat, I would be thrilled with this government guaranteed, uh, you know, three lakh crore measure because it allows me to top up whoever I've lent money to by 20%, um, earn the interest, and somebody else is bearing the credit risk. So I would be thrilled. Would the company be thrilled? Not really. Because as you were making the point, Ira, effectively you're increasing your debt burden. It doesn't matter what the interest rate is, whether it's 9%, 6%, 7%, you're still bearing a cost. So your, your, you know, your problem is you don't have a top line. Your bottom line has gone deeply red and you're being offered debt. That's hardly a relief or a solution for the companies on the ground, which is why I'm saying the relief required is to the bottom line, to the profit and loss. Where... You know, Dr. Rakesh Mohan's idea of complete interest rate subvention, not just for this 3 lakh crores, but for the entire 20 lakh crores or whatever that number is of bank and NBFC loans to MSME would be in order. Now, look, Anand has a good point. It's nice to say I want, all of us will stand up and say I want this, I want that. We can ask for the moon, sun, moon, everything put together. There's a limited room. So how do you decide what is required and what can be afforded, what can't be afforded? As you rightly pointed out, what is required in terms of survival and support for basic requirements has to be provided for, right? So we decided, we agreed, for instance, that you know people who have lost their jobs, 
uh, you have to make sure that basic essential requirements are being met, whether it's food, whether it's you know uh, clothing, whether it's uh, housing and security and all that kind. Right. Likewise, for businesses, if there are businesses which are going to face existential crisis, it's no longer about just being humanitarian. It's also you know for financial stability of our own economy. As Dr. Sen was saying, one year later, if they all go, go belly up, we won't have supply. We won't have an infrastructure available to create output, right? So it's it's in our interest, therefore, to ensure that we provide some kind of support. Now, it's also possible support that you provide goes to people who don't require it. Lots of MSMEs, by the way, are not necessarily bleeding. They're in the right sectors, so they're in you know, pharma or medical enterprises or whatever, so they might be doing well, right? It's okay. So even if you give money to people who don't deserve it, part of it will come back by way of taxes. And B, by the way, you know, let's not nitpick. If some people get it who don't deserve it, that's fine. Let's move on. So I think that part, it should be clear that, that some amount of relief is absolutely essential to preserve financial stability going forward. The last bit I will add is, I think as we decide and do more of these relief measures to provide support, it's absolutely important that we have a medium-term plan in place as to how we're going to grow out of this. The, the more clarity you have around the plan about how you are eventually going to create jobs and output, and as Dr. Atin Roy is fond of saying, expand the number of consumers from beyond the 150 million people and make it a more broad base of jobs and output. If you have a decent, cogent plan, which we can all believe in, and we believe we're moving in that direction, that will give us a lot more confidence of being able to provide support right now. Uh, Dr. Sen, I still think that the question of how you design support for larger enterprises has not been answered. So I'm going to persist on that question for you because it's uh, easier said than done. And I am going to add on my second part as well, that given what we know of multipliers, et cetera, et cetera, is a large government public works program perhaps you know, the easier option right now? It's not a question of whether it's easier. Look, large government work programs are not easy by any means. Um, they require uh, managerial capacity, which uh, which would strain seriously the capabilities of both the center and the state. So let, let's not kid ourselves that that's going to be easy. The point is, again, I think as Anand said, about the Rothian's whole issue of widening the consumer base. So if you think about widening the consumer base, then what you're really talking about is being able to provide income to those who would be the next run of consumers. So you're taking it from the 150 million to let's say 300 million or and so on. Public work programs properly designed are actually very good for that purpose. And the bang for the buck that you get is much larger than if you had depended only on direct transfers. That's the way you need to think of it. Now, as far as the large corporates are concerned, what is the nature of the problem? As far as any enterprise is concerned, there are two problems that they're facing. One is their ability to survive and bear the cost of survival till such time as production and sales can resume. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the uncertainty surrounding the nature of competition that they are going to face once they are open, they have started production. These are the two problems that they're facing. As far as the corporate sector is concerned, they really don't have the same degree of problem in either case. So again, if you look at the recent data, what has been happening? The large companies, particularly in the FMCG space, are actually eating, are gaining market share because the SMEs have, have simply stopped production. Right? So their issue is much more, do they have the staying capacity? By and large, they do. There will be some of the corporates who are in the smaller category whose staying power may be limited. There will be some companies who have over leveraged themselves who will have a problem. And the biggest problem is going to be with those companies who have very high exposure to external markets. Right? 
And I think on this, I would go with the unreconstructed Thatcherite approach. They met the bed, let them lie on it. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Roy, since uh, you know you have been writing about the sort of uh, you know producing output that can be sold to a wider uh, you know, sort of set, set of Indians, uh, you've been writing on this approach for a while. Uh, does this pivot happen uh, organically? Uh, is there a role for policy to play in this, or is this just uh, you know businesses organically realizing that they need to target a different or a wider set of consumers at different price points? No, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's important to understand there's a role not for policy. There's a role for policy, but before that, there's a, there's a need to change an attitude. And that's a very communist attitude that we have in this country, which is that you can only make money out of selling ice creams or out of producing chemicals, you know, and or out of, uh, you know, selling stuff where your uh, value by margins are high. And everything else is not worth it. That whole attitude to agriculture, which I found quite disgusting since I came back to this country, which is, it's a horrible place. There are too many people hired there. And these patch statements economists make, you know, that well, the problem with agriculture is you have to get people off the land. Now, that's a communist statement to make. Who are you to get people off the land? Market forces decide who stays where. And I think it's quite insulting to tell people who are in agriculture that they're in agriculture because they're stupid. They're not stupid. They're in agriculture because they're satisfying a certain you know, maximization problem, which we all do. So therefore, there are two ways of looking at it. No? If agriculture, you know, I've been trying to get a grant. Now it's too late, I've resigned. They give me grants for all sorts of things, but this for around. I wanted to just take 13 agroclimatic zones of India and work out the EBITDAs, balance sheets, and pay and accounts of different types of farmers. Not a penny is available for that. I want to know, how, you know whether that business makes money. Nobody's told me about that. They they grow more food, how to be productive, how to use less water. It's all communism. But do they make money? Who makes money in agriculture? How can we make them make more money? If they make more money, then agriculture will survive. I will not repeat my story about the fact that this 3,000 rupee shirt, it's an old shirt, so I look so fed well, uh, is 90% made in India, Marks and Spencer, but 400 rupee shirts are made abroad. Why? What's the problem in entering the 400 rupee market? I've written extensively on this. Why is everyone so obsessed with real estate in Gurgaon? What's wrong with making 15% on 20 lakh houses? I've got solutions on that. And that would involve a policy change. For example, I have to ask the Indian Army uh, why they really need all the land that they seem to be sitting on. It's not in Ladakh. Yeah? And it's not on the Pakistan border. It's right there in the middle of Bombay and Delhi. So I need to ask the Indian Army, you know, what do you mean with this? Why should why should we be building, be building a civilian airport 40 kilometers outside Pune? And the Indian Air Force has a giant base with its Sukhoi's and things, eight kilometers outside. So there we have a policy question. Health and education are not charity. You can make money out of health and education. And by money, I just don't mean profit there. But there is an EBITDA to health and education, which is a reward to the economy and a reward to people. If you're healthy, you earn more money. If you're better educated, you earn more money. So we, if imagine a situation with COVID today, if 60% of our GDP came from these five sectors, we would be much more resilient now than we are now hankering all about auto parts and automobile parts and, you know, uh, people preparing punctures in rural areas, etc., etc. That's the kind of economic transformation we need to be talking about. And that involves a pivot in the desire of the private sector to make money. They need to understand that there are many, many ways of making money and they don't have that. The ability of banks to back that risk appetite to make money in places that are different from media today and then complementary policies from government to facilitate that. So actually what I'm arguing is for health and education and agriculture, but not the old argument. I'm arguing that we can make GDP is making money. So let's go out and make some money from these sectors. We'll have more resilient sectors. We'll have more people consuming, a wider swathe of producers, and we'll be on our road to development transformation. Dr. Nageshwaran, the medium term framework as we, uh, you know, sort of uh, find our way through this crisis. Uh, and I do want to just, you know, uh, throw in a note here, you know, we keep coming back to that old, oh, we can be the next China because we want to export our way into prosperity. I mean, about time we stop doing export focused reports. I think I've read 10 of them in my short career. I'm sure you all have read even more. Uh, let's think different if that hasn't worked. Uh, no, so... Again, valid point and a valid question. Let me first uh, quickly take on the two points made by Anand Narayan and uh, Dr. Ratindra. I mean, if you want to make uh, goods for the bottom 80% of the population, then it's a question of having uh, affordable cost at which you can make them. 
and uh, Anand pointed out the lack of a medium term growth strategy. So if you can marry the two. So again, uh, if Dr. Rai's first inference was right, that the government was merely trying to get out of the way, then the last two weeks, all of us might have received uh, team leases, three images of the uh, compliance burdens that India is facing between the union government and the state governments, compliances, laws. So clearly a policy of simply whittling away many of those unwanted uh, rules, restrictions and regulations would be a start. That, that, that satisfies both getting out of the way, that satisfies Anand Narayan's request for a medium term growth strategy, and that satisfies Dr. Roy's point about how do you make goods for the bulk of the population is to reduce the cost. And then the second point is, besides these rules and regulations, the second point is about understanding that the bulk of the reforms that needs to happen lie in the realm of state governments, whether it is land, labor, education, and health. So clearly we need a certain consensus, and I think a point a start has to be made committing ourselves to just three or four areas because uh, there is a paper out there from the Center for International Development at the Harvard University uh, which is a wonderful paper published uh, uh, almost a couple of years ago uh, but still very very relevant that you don't try and address every problem because uh, you need to have certain credibility and sometimes the bandwagon effect automatically will kick in if you address few core areas so getting the state governments to agree on three or four areas where they could reform whether the floor space index or making the conversion of land from agriculture to non-agriculture slightly less cumbersome and less rent seeking, those are the things which will automatically create uh, the momentum. So uh, uh, to Anand's point about a legitimate need for a medium term growth strategy is to choose two or, th two or three areas for the union and the state governments. And that would also answer Dr. Roy's point about making goods for uh, everybody. To come to your point about the exports, I completely agree with you. Uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a situation of you know, weak global growth and everybody trying to reshore production and becoming very nationalistic, to expect growth to be your growth drive, exports to be your growth driver, as it was between 2003 and 8, is a pipe dream. But however, this situation is about grabbing market share because the pie is not growing. And to grab the export market share, you need to still emphasize on productivity and performance. That is why I said uh, we should support the industries, but with performance quid pro quo in terms of productivity. And that is exactly taking a leaf out of the East Asia book, which is that you do support industries, but only provided uh, they, they, they deliver. In fact, Joe Sudwell put it very beautifully. They didn't support performers as much as those governments hurt the non-performers. I think I think that is the process to go. But otherwise, I agree with you. Emulating China from where we are with the kind of uh, 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 high cost of production and the legislative and the compliance burden that our businesses carry is 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 not going to happen. So right now, that is why Vietnam and Mexico and Bangladesh are getting the uh, industries moving out of China and not India. And we need to basically face up to the fact that we are not there yet, and it is a process, and it is not something that is driven that is completed in three to six. Months, but we have to begin somewhere. Sorry about uh, the long answer. No, 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 absolutely. And the reason I brought in exports was simply on the wider point that we need a slightly, uh, you know, sort of uh, reviewed thinking on our medium term growth. But Dr. Sen, do you want to come in on this? Some of these longer term questions which are back and perhaps, uh, you know, as many keep repeating, uh, sometimes uh, just for the sake of it, a crisis reform, you know, let's not waste a good crisis. Is this the moment that we start pivoting? Dr. Sen, your mic is on mute, sir. Uh, you know, the point is that the longer term reforms are all very well. But when you do them, needs to be in the context of where the economy is at that particular point in time. I mean, to give you an example, one of the big components of the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, package is really disinvestment in the PSUs. Privatization, increasing degrees of privatization. Now, this is a perfectly laudable objective, except this is not the time to do it. As it is, we are in a situation where the appetite for investment is very low. If you start, let's say, a privatization of very strongly driven privatization process now, 
what you will be doing is you will be eating into whatever investment intentions there happen to exist. So people who are planning to put up a greenfield or a brownfield capacity will simply shift those resources to buying existing capacity, which doesn't add to the capacity of the economy at all, which is the way you want to go. Privatization is best done when the demand for investment opportunities is outpacing what the economy actually needs. That's when you privatize. This is the wrong time to do. So as a menu, that's fine. But we need to be very clear that in that menu, what is the soup? What is the starter? What is the main course? And what is the dessert? Unfortunately, we've been given no indication as to whether any such prioritization, any such time phasing has been even thought about. Dr. Nageshwan, you have a point to make. I uh, noticed you were smiling. I, know, I think, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I, I, I'm smiling because I, I agree with them that um, Dr. Sen's point that you need to sort of choose your reforms and choose what you uh, need to do. Yes, he's right. Because even before the COVID happened, uh, we have been struggling to uh, privatize and attract interest for Air India. This is well before uh, COVID happened. But as a statement of intent, as a signal, it, it is a valid signal to send that, you know, when things normalize, we are not looking to be an interventionist government, but somebody that is going to be withdrawing. So that part of it is right. So he's, I think uh, his point is that while structural reforms are fine and dandy, you need to have a certain sequencing and you need to prioritize certain things now and certain things later. So obviously it is a very unexceptionable uh, statement to make. Uh, Dr. Roy, uh, you went offline for a bit, but uh, you know, I think so. The debate was what do you do in terms of what is uh, called. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, okay. So, you, so you heard the conversation. So, you know, just as an extension of that, uh, reforms is a con uh, consequence of crisis. If one looks back to 1991, what was changed after the uh, crisis had a link into what the crisis came out of. Here, if one were to look at certain reforms that are needed, as uh, learnings from this crisis, what would be relevant to you, my, to your mind? You don't uh, learn from a disaster management crisis, do you? Why? You, you, could, you, could, say we need, you could say we need increased health spending, for instance. That's a no-brainer, so done. Next, what do I say? Urban, urban, so, urban jobs guarantee, for instance. What so thinking that about? Was, that was asked to earlier. I mean, the fact is, what this crisis tells me is that we were not concerned that the India growth story was all about a bunch of people from the coming from 2000, regularly, coming 2,000 miles a year, sitting in our faces, working not just as dwellers and in factory flop shop world, but as our cooks, maids, drivers, cleaners, and going back 2,000 kilometers. The business of the railways had changed over the last 17 years. I saw no commentary on it. I saw a book by Arvind Nadiga, that's about it. You know, there was very little commentary on the macroeconomic implications of this kind of tectonic movement of labor, which begs the question, why is it that industry is not able to locate where the labor is? Surely, low wage costs is not the problem in UP. I think recent newspaper events tell you very pointedly what the problem in UP is. And we should learn from that. So I think the lessons we have learned from this disaster that has hit us is not, we had a crisis, what do we learn from it, reform and go forward. That's a terrible, I think, juxtaposition to make with 1991. The lessons from this crisis, if there are any from this, from this uh, disaster, is that we have already had serious socio-political barriers to growth. Some of them are no-brainers, like a low-wage uh, people are sitting in northern and eastern India. The industry is growing in western and southern India. Why? Second, the recognition that people who work in India are Indians first, and not people who have to be packed off at the first side of a crisis. And the, 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 the answer to that is not government should stay. Government should stay, we know, under conditions which did not inspire confidence. So what we saw was a massive breaking of the law which government could do nothing about. And doing the most fundamental thing possible, walking. Walking, it's, the, it's, it's bigger than anything that happened in 1991. Millions of people walking. That is what they've got to learn from, that when millions of people walk, it tells you that the bedrock of the social process in which your growth is, is very weak. And that will in turn tell you why you don't have good healthcare. 
I think it is a terrible thing that we are saying we must have good healthcare now because all of us are hiding in our homes on webinars saying, oh God, COVID, I can't go to the bar. Well, the bedrock of it is we have bad healthcare and it needs to get better. And if it got better, then we would not have had this worry about migrant labor moving and affecting our lives. And if we learn that lesson, then we will have an argument that good healthcare is good for the country. It's not just something you do for people. Uh, you know, good education is good for the country. We need to improve the quality of education so that people, you know, understand from that education why mass spending is important. So a number of lessons you can draw, but I'm afraid they're far more complicated than, oh, we had a crisis, let's take advantage of it. I don't think that happened in 1991 either. That's another story. I think the problem is that we've been hit with a disaster that has shown us the skeletons in our cover, the dark spaces in which we have hidden things and pretended this great India gold story is going on well. And all those ET now seminar, whatever, you know, not ET in particular. You know what I mean? Those big jamborees, you moderated many of them going on, people wearing ties and suits and, you know, sort of thinking that all things, everything is okay. Everything is not okay. Everything is, is actually not okay at all. I've been saying this for years with the way the Indian economy is going. And therefore, we have to, as a society, do a fundamental rethink, part of which is the output composition change in growth, but part of it is also questions of citizenship, liberty, and fraternity, which have to be fostered within society so that political forces can then take that up and make us more inclusive. That was the China story, a very important part of it, plus dictatorship which allowed them to suspend somewhat liberties. That was definitely the South Korea story. That was not the Philippine story. That was not the Brazil story. So we have a stark choice. In 2025, forget $5 trillion. You want to be Brazil or Philippines, or you want to be South Korea? This watershed moment has come faster than I expected. And I think this we need to, we need to have a dialogue to understand how we can shift tracks in a major way to move towards that inclusion, which is the only optimal and sustainable way we can grow better. Automobiles and four-wheelers and Indigo Airlines and Hingoga. Anand? Well, uh, superb comments from everybody. So I'm going to tie some of your questions together, uh, Ira, along with the comments made by uh, the other panelists. Uh, you originally asked, should public spending happen right now, public works, etc., right? Uh, as uh, Dr. Roy said, I think it's a no-brainer when it comes to health, education, and um, uh, maybe even nutrition. Frankly, public spending has to happen. You know, if, if we keep saying that demographics is going to be our, our key to our success, etc., we're not spending. And I've seen fantastic presentations from Anand Nageshwar, you know, describing the situation of our healthcare spending, education spending, etc. Clearly, that needs to go up. No questions asked. On other kind of public works, now, hark back to 2008. Uh, when we were coming out of the global financial crisis, and mind you, we were not impacted directly, the panacea was seen as large fiscal spending, followed by large public-private pu partnerships towards infrastructure. You can call it telephone banking, etc., but this was the gist that we'll put into large infrastructure works. It didn't work. And I'll again go back to what Dr. Roy was saying. If Let's not learn lessons from COVID-19. COVID-19 is out of syllabus, once in a 100 years situation, let's keep it aside. Let's look at the lessons we learned from the years before that, the 10 years before that. And there are some stark situations that we have to recognize out here. In fact, again, referring to the presentation I saw from Dr. Anand, um, why is our worker participation rate 35%? Why is it that only 17% of our GDP is contributed by women? Why is it that even now 44% of our, of our workforce is into agriculture? I think we have to accept uh, the stark reality, which is that we've been doing a terrible job of creating jobs and output. For the last many, many years, it's not a one government, two government thing. It's been going on for many, many years. Now, we need a medium term strategy to get us out of this rut where we get into a virtuous cycle where money creation can happen alongside supply creation, alongside job creation, alongside consumption. We need that virtuous cycle. And it's not going to happen overnight. It requires a lot of hard work. In my mind, there are three elements which are required. One. Even before COVID-19, and you and I have had lots of arguments on this uh, era, the state of our financial services ecosystem was in no shape to fund the growth that we require, our growth aspirations. That's number one, that requires a complete overhaul. Second, besides the, and linked to the financial sector, lots of other sectors, power, real estate, telecom, airline and shipping, these have been facing chronic stresses, which are, frankly, the, the can has been kicked down the road of all of them for many, many years now. And we're just sort of pretending that the story doesn't exist, the bad story doesn't exist. The third part is what Prime Minister Modi referred to in his, in his Atmanirbhar speech, which is if you want ease of investments, and it doesn't matter, and you're right about this exports fascination, it could be for make for India, it could be for make in India, it doesn't matter. We need jobs, simple, right? But if you need to create jobs and output, 
you need lots of reforms. He referred to them as, as terms, you know, land reform, labor reform, laws, liquidity, and, you know, supply chains from China, all of that. But these are tough. These are not easy reforms to get done. And all these three put together, financial sector, other sectors, and ease of investments for jobs and output, these are boil the ocean changes, you know, call them second generation reforms, whatever you call them. And it requires a huge amount of coordination amongst multiple stakeholders. I, I think I think we can get at the good news is lots of committees and commissions, which these gentlemen have been part of as well, have given good recommendations on what needs to be done for each of these areas. So the, the prescriptions are all there. Implementation is the problem. And the problem I see currently, Ira, why I'm not convinced that we are on the path of reforms is yet. I think we need three elements for these reforms to go through. You need political leadership with a clear vision. You need empowered experts who are actually leading the charge as well. And you need a very efficient bureaucracy. At the moment, when I see the announcements coming out, you know, whether the five-part announcements or the marathon speech given by a finance minister, they all bear the stamp of the bureaucracy. We don't have enough empowered experts. We don't have enough vision and leadership coming in on the economic side from the political leadership as yet. If we get these three elements, I think all these problems I listed out have solutions. No reason why we can't make this. Sorry, I took a lot of time. Dr. Narayan, how do we get those three? Bureaucracy reform, I think, has been spoken about for, for a while. I'm sure it's far easier said than done. Uh, but, uh, you know, empowered experts, we have committees, we have, you know, Niti Aayog's replacements of Planning Commission, etc. So, I mean, that infrastructure, brick and mortar uh, seems to be in place, but it's not working. So, I guess sometimes when the problem looks uh, very highly intractable, as it does, because the political economy of this is quite formidable, then it is good to break it down into small parts and begin somewhere and send a message that you will uh, get to the, the more difficult elements. So, for example, one way to signal that would be to say we will first start by fixing India's, you know, Dr. Sen would be the person to answer that, fixing the credibility of the Indian statistics. He pointed out in his beautiful five-page, five-part uh, series, uh, how um, uh, post-demonetization growth rate appeared to be much better than the previous years because of the fact that you inferred. Uh, the informal sector's contribution from the formal sector, which happened to gain some demonetization and therefore appeared to give a false sense of actually things were looking better. So when you have an idiosyncratic shock that was not transmitted throughout the economy, then these approximations broke down from formal to informal. So you need to fix the credibility of the economic uh, statistics, both at the central level and the state level. And if you start with that, that itself will then lead you to understanding the problems better. And then one by one, you can sort of uh, lead to uh, a situation where you draw in experts who are not politically you know, controversial for you, acceptable, and who have multiple perspectives. So I would say break down complex problems into smaller elements and start from the one that sends a credible signal about your commitment. And then you move on because obviously there are no templates in the situation. I mean, today's developed countries did not grow on the basis of planned economies, on the basis of governments guiding them what to do. So I think uh, uh, the overall principle of somehow letting the entrepreneurial spirit of the country uh, being unleashed is fair. But the government has a role to play in knowing which areas it needs to step away from and which areas it needs to fix. So giving that clarity will be a very good starting point. Dr. Roy, you want to uh, throw in a view there? Well, I completely agree. Uh, and I agree that there are uh, real political economy constraints. I'll just leave your audience with a hint. In what country of the world is it the case that the senior executive service that we call the IAS or IPS, let's take the IPS, the educational qualifications to apply for a competitive exam to become an IPS officer are exactly the same as for a sub inspector of police. That should tell you something. That should tell you something about what exactly we are doing when we are recruiting a civil service. And then to talk about natural entry and things like that misses the point to some extent. This is a big takeaway when I was in the takeaway. So I agree with uh, Anand, we need to have bite sized chunks that we uh, need to look at. But I think we also need to recognize something. And again, this relates to COVID. I had a lot of problems with the Planning Commission. Uh, 
chief as a fiscal guy when i found that the planning commission was uh, spending more on revenue expenditure than capital expenditure and that the biggest spender on capital expenditure was non plan expenditure because of the defense ministry so the state of affairs had obtained 13 years ago when i was with the 13th finance commission i said this is rubbish you know uh, and for the book i'm writing i've just been going to the finance minister's speeches and you can see that people stop taking planning seriously sometime in the early 80s so it was going over to change but then there were two things there which was one collaborative ecosystem operations for better or worse the planning commission was doing that simply because it had an all india conversation going at the level of the states it also had an all india conversation going all all global conversation going with the policy ecosystem which had got to be directly pertinent to the issue immediately at hand and like the case of the finance ministry today if you want to talk to the revenue department they'll have a global conversation on gst by it say or they'll have a conversation on the mess that revenue is in if you ask them why is it that you are able to forecast taxes you can only provide estimates not even projections they are interested planning commission could do that you see so there was a sort of room there for expertise to gather even if you had a low opinion of anyone in the planning commission except dr kadam sen there was room there for gathering of expertise that is gone today there is no room to gather expertise in the niti aayog the niti aayog essentially produces some very bright ideas produced by some very bright young people and then they vanish they are attempt at producing a strategic plan for india which is what they were engaged in for three of the past five years of the regime has been an abject failure and there is no alternative where there is some strategic plan in terms so today if i am going to uh, and, and it's also by the way and we have all got used to this it's like opium the media is only interested in the budget the moment i say medium term framework their eyes glaze over because they don't that's want to that's not true that's not true at all you and i have had conversations about the medium term framework and i think you're the only person who have had a conversation with in the entire media who has taken this notion seriously and it goes back to being a grown up economy see in a grown up economy you should have the guts which which is patently lacking at the moment and this is a big problem in our current crisis management to say that on the basis of the argument i'm going to give you this is what i forecast tax revenues to be in 3 years not what i estimate or what i project this is what i forecast is going to happen to gdp if we just say oh let's do 5 trillion dollar economy and then work down that's like going back to old fashioned planning and very bad planning at that because you're not looking at capital output ratios you're not asking what production consumption would be so we as a society seem to have lost confidence in our own future as a signal i get from our increasing unwillingness to talk about the medium term if we are able to do that as a society then we will be able to direct our bureaucracy to talk about the medium term our politicians will then be inspired to talk about the medium term I, I think it is a fundamental error to say of all politicians that they are only interested in getting elected the next time. That's not my experience of politicians. Really good politicians want to be in the history books. They want to be up there with Napoleon in the footlights. They may succeed or they may fail, but they know that being in the history books, you need to get elected, but you also need to deliver something in the medium term. You know that was the difference I think between let's say statesmen like Mr. Vajpayee or Mr. Mandela and others. that you wanted to leave a legacy of history you could be successful or unsuccessful so that reclaiming we have to do if we are going to achieve what are correctly said are the very formidable challenges before us we have to have faith that we have a bright future and the courage to spell out how we are going to get there not just targets a plan in this sense Okay, uh, you know we are about ten uh, odd minutes before we wrap up, and I'm going to lean on a uh, question from uh, uh, Arvind Chari, who's uh, you know uh, follows the economy uh, quite well. But he says that he wants, and I I fully agree with him, uh, to have all of you uh, put on the spot and say if you were the finance secretary or the finance minister, what would be the five things that you would do? Uh, and I'm hoping somewhere in the middle somebody will mention the Indonesia experience because uh, I the conversation we had a week ago. Get to have a chance. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sen, uh, the question being, if you were the finance minister as finance secretary, right? Uh, what would be the five things that you would want? Well, uh, I don't know if I can tick off five, but what I would do: number one, reverse. First step: reverse the order that the finance minister has already given, which is all new projects be put on hold. That's number one. Get them off the ground and get them off now. because ministries have spent 2 to 3 years in preparing these the background work is done the approvals are there just get on with it number 2 identify projects 
where you can ramp up your expenditures quickly and substantially. NREGS is one, but there is a limitation there, which comes from state finances, which I'm not going to go into, but there, there is an issue there. But things like rural roads, things like uh, micro and mini irrigation, things like rural and urban housing, these are all approved projects, and it's just a question of, of going ahead. Number three, announce a major program for the upgradation of all health centers across the country. All, not just the hospitals, but the PHCs and the sub-centers as well. Number four, announce a major program of urban renewal. Take advantage of the fact that you had a very large number of migrants who have left the cities, the pressure on our urban spaces is relatively less today. Start the process before these people come back and then you have to go through the absolutely heartbreaking process of displacing them from their homes. Fifth, please for God's sake, spend over and above what you budgeted for something like five lakh crores. And monetize it. I don't care how you finance it. You may not have to monetize all of it. You'll have to monetize, in my estimate, about three to three and a half lakh crores. Dr. Roy, five yeah. things. Say, I, I'd rather say that the first thing I had to do is seek a transfer to the Prime Minister's office. The way things are going nowadays with the finance ministry. But assuming that we were in a finance ministry that was actually, you know, making policy. No, sorry, uh, I didn't hear you well. I didn't hear you well. Said, the first thing you said. The first finance secretary seek a transfer to the Prime Minister's office. Since clearly policy is made there, it would so appear to me. But uh, failing that, uh, if I was to be an operational finance ministry, the first thing I would do is, well, first I would improve communication. The first thing I would communicate is this. I'm not going to worry about how much I spend until I tell you, the public of India, what I'm going to spend on over the next three years. And I'm going to commit and be accountable to what that is going to do to improve the state of the economy. I will communicate that first. I call it my three years spending battle plan. And we can differ on what you spend on. You will see resonances on that. And I would try and come to a view, taking professional advice on what it is we should spend on, whether we do public works programs or whether we ramp up healthcare or do both and in what measure. And then I would present number two, a calibrated spending program saying, one, I will get this money in year T plus two by the recovery of tax revenues I will get from my spending program. Interim to that recovery, I would immediately have COVID specific bonds, consoles. Uh, need I elaborate? I won't. Consoles are basically for the audience bonds that you know you pay the interest on, and I would suggest you pay an attractive rate of interest, but you do so in you, you pay the the principal is in principle be payable only in perpetuity. I decide when I will pay you, but you keep getting the interest. Okay, it's a perpetual. And by the way, I thought of this before the European Union. Added to that, I would make sure that the cash load of approximately 1 to 1.5 trillion rupees that is scattered around different government of India bank accounts, not in treasury, is mobilized. I would then see what the incremental remainder I need, what I can get from Vedela borrowing in due course, which would be more short term and, and, and marketable, and what I can get from privatization in years T. See, the only thing your year T plus one privatization is impossible. If I'm thinking of T plus one to T plus three, privatization is possible. So that it is investment receipts coming. And if it's a matter of gearing between years T plus one and T plus three, if I had a medium term framework, I'd use a multi period WME. So I've only given you four places to find money. That's my job. I'm a fiscal expert. Then I worry about this thing that needs to obsess everybody monetization. Relax. There's lots you have to do, but first you have to tell me what I'm going to spend the money on. What is it going to, when is it going to get you paid back? We do it in a three to five year framework. There is enough fiscal instrumentation. If it's a matter of liquidity management, it costs three to five years to do it. As an extraordinary case in a multi-period pay, we need not be tied to the annual calendar. That's three steps. The fourth step I would do is immediately and instantly commit that every further regulation issued regarding the private sector, uh, credit management, etc., by either the RBI, since I'm on the board, or the Ministry of Finance, or the Ministry of Commerce, or any other entity who goes around shooting off these undramatical regulations, commits to a time frame in which this regulation will not be altered. 
and that time frame cannot be less than 18 months. Cannot be. It is a bad and weak government that has to regulate, constantly tinker and alter its regulations repeatedly. This has been going on for too long. There are accusations this is done due to nepotism. I think a lot of it is just incompetence, and that has got to stop. And I find out why I'm not able to do it. And then if I needed to bring in expertise to do it, I would do so. And the final thing that I would commit in the finance ministry is to a transparent conversation regarding the three big issues of our time. Why is it that my economy, my economy's growth was slowing before COVID? It's essentially equipment to write that medium term plan. Number two, why are my tax receipts stagnating irrespective of whether I grow fast or whether I grow slow? Number three, to what extent is it important for me to acknowledge that my expenditure management systems are poor? And by what time frame would I come out with a plan that will give you metrics that will show that government will spend its money more effectively and more efficiently? And number five, I would start a conversation headed by the defense minister, if the finance minister would be so kind, on how to use government land to make India slum free, because that's also an asset, that's also a resource. I would start a conversation, I repeat, with the defense minister, with the vice chair being the railway minister, on how to use central government land to deliver a slum free India in the metropolitan areas by 2020. Both fabulous. Dr. Nageshwaran, you want to add to that or pick up on any of those points, a combination of them? Uh, no, I, I will add to them, but I will uh, probably be expanding the question to the remit of the government and not just the finance minister or the finance secretary. So I would start by saying that the government of India will do away with income tax assessment and will rely on the uh, existing mechanisms of TDS, advanced tax, and you know, uh, to to for people to make tax payments because 92% of the direct taxes come from voluntary compliance and there is enough data with the government to ensure that it doesn't drop off the cliff. So doing away with income tax assessment will be a very good signal to the uh, public businesses and people about the ease of doing business, ease of living in the country. The second would be, I would uh, give a three month time frame to restore, even if it means restating the growth rates of some of the years to restore macroeconomic data credibility of the states and the union macro data, the country level macro data. And the third thing I would do would be to, um, uh, as you know, Anant and I have been privately discussing several times, to use this opportunity to appoint a crack team of experts from different disciplines serving and for current former bureaucrats and experts in other fields, which will report to the, you know, the cabinet committee on economic affairs and empowered committee and that will make decisions. That will be number three. Number four, um, uh, using the opportunity of the global value chains trying to relocate out of China, call directly the top 20 businesses uh, which are looking to move out of China. Ask them a couple of questions. What is it that would make you move to India? And find out what is the time frame that they are willing to give India. And then open up this idea to different states and ask them which state is ready to deliver on these and then create a competition among them. And that would be a very credible way of going about uh, attracting uh, companies to relocate to India. My fourth suggestion would be uh, to organize a conclave of state chief ministers or the finance ministers or both and agree on three just three important reforms and ensure that it is time bound it is deliverable it is monitorable on whether it is land or power or whether it is water or education or health choose any three and then uh, report on them the fifth one would be that as a finance uh, person uh, i would agree to cap the cess in the total revenues of the union government because while the official shareable portion has been increasing but the cess portion has been rising much faster which is not shared with the state so i would commit to cap the cess in the total revenue of the union government and also uh, come out with the firm settlement of the gst compensation cess these would be the five things to do uh, uh, anant uh, to you for your five but also i'll uh, uh, request you to after that to perhaps help us wrap up the conversation Oh, you do the wrapping up era. So, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll stop. Uh, great. Look, fantastic suggestion. So, very difficult to come up with new ones, but I'll tell you what I would do. First, I'm an armchair professor. I don't have to do anything. So, I'll just dream on and go, like Anand said, which is go beyond finance secretary to a higher level. Uh, first, on COVID 19, we don't know how long this is going to go on. 
uh, be prepared to provide whatever relief is required, both to the workforce, to people, and to small businesses. Don't worry about the fisc. Uh, what needs to be provided will be has to be provided. So that's point number one. Be ready to spend when required. Um, having said that, the next parts will be about a medium term plan, the one that Dr. Roy referred to, which is you have to have a plan of how you go beyond COVID-19, right? There I would do the following. First, I would look at the financial services ecosystem. Uh, it is in no shape, even before COVID-19, to, to fund our, our growth aspirations. I would rope in experts, like Anand said, I would rope in experts. You you take names, you know, Uday Kotak, uh, Deepak Parekh, you, you name it. Enough number of good people who can be roped in for all of these uh, big long-term measures. But for the banking and the financial sector system, you probably need a one-time solution for the NPAs. IBC and uh, IBC, uh, NCLT are good, but they're not enough. You also need banking reforms like BGNI committee reforms. You also need governance reforms. You also need market reforms. All of that entire financial services ecosystem cleanup has to happen. Next, when you look at the other sectors which are chronically stressed, power, real estate, telecom, airline and shipping, get in experts again, empower them, ask them to tell you how to solve these issues, lock up those people, all the stakeholders in one room, state government, central government, secretaries, and so on and so forth. Don't open the door until they've come out of the solution, right? Uh, and, and don't kick the can down the road. So clean up the, that entire mess of those stressed out uh, sectors. Fine. The, the fourth part would be uh, what we talked about, ease of doing investments, creating jobs and output. And this is going to be tough. Again, you need multiple stakeholders. You need experts. You need central governments, state governments. Get in the Foxconns. Get in the, you know, the, the Boeings and the uh, Lockheed Martins to give you inputs. Uh, your own domestic uh, investors are, are them to give inputs and make changes to ease investments and therefore create jobs and output. The last fifth bit, I think one lesson we have to take away, the need to invest in healthcare, education, and nutrition. You know, you know Bhutto is uh, fond of saying, even if you have to eat grass, we'll create a nuclear bomb in response to our nuclear test, right? Our motto has to be, even if you have to eat grass, we have to give our children education, healthcare, and nutrition. I think that has to be our motto. Completely. So these would be the five things. Again, armchair professor, so I can say whatever I want. Back to you here. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, actually. <laughs> Excuse me. All of those suggestions have been very, very useful. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying uh, that, uh, you know, we've had a chance to discuss the near term. I won't try and sum up, sum up what uh, the, all the experts have said. I'll uh, goof up in a monumental way. All I'll say is that we do have an immediate problem, uh, which I think everyone agrees is not uh, been adequately tackled. Uh, that needs to be certainly done, but uh, we also need to start thinking about medium term frameworks for the country's growth uh, with a reminder to ourselves that it was snowing even before we hit this crisis. And there are some useful suggestions across different uh, areas from the experts. Thank you all so much. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry we couldn't take all of the questions that came through, but it was a very uh, interactive panel. There are lots of interesting comments on the site. Uh, we will all go through in the recording and take note of some of your suggestions. Uh, I'll wrap it up there, uh, Anand. Uh, thanks a lot, Ira. Uh, on behalf of SPJMR and CFS, thank you, Ira. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pranab Sen. Thank you, Dr. Ratim Roy. And thank you, uh, Anand Nageshwan. Uh, fantastic panel discussion. We should do this more often. And um, this is extremely enriching uh, and, 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 and a lot of fun, to be honest. So uh, thank you again, Ira. And uh, back to all of you. Yes, Ira. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You thank you for your time. Enjoyed being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you, uh, we'll probably all agree that you are the favorite anchor. <laughs> Absolutely. Banker? <laughs> you just anchor, anchor, anchor. <laughs> anchor. I, I'm not sure I take that as a compliment right now, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs>